Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Grace Mullane? Another question here would be, what is the rough sex defense? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll take a look at the background. It's fairly brief in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. This case primarily involves two people, Grace Mullane and Jesse Kempson. Grace Mullane was born on December 2, 1996. She lived in Essex, England. She earned a bachelor's degree in advertising and marketing from the University of Lincoln. Jesse Kempson was 26 years old at the time of the crime. He lived in New Zealand. He was raised there by his father and grandfather after his parents separated when he was nine years old. His mother had moved to Australia. Kempson was estranged from his family. They had caught him stealing from them, and they told him he needed to receive mental health counseling or move out of the family home. He decided to go to Australia. He lived there with his mother in Sydney from 2013 to 2016. After this, he moved back to New Zealand. On prior occasions, he had been arrested in both Auckland, New Zealand, and Sydney, Australia for disorderly behavior. He also had a DUI conviction in New Zealand. He worked on various occasions as a laborer and bartender. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. In 2018, Grace decided to travel to a number of places in various areas around the world and backpack. On November 20, 2018, she arrived in New Zealand. She had been in South America for six weeks before that. She planned on spending two weeks in New Zealand. Ten days later, on November 30, she arrived in Auckland. The next day, December 1, she was spotted on Victoria Street at 9 p.m. She was captured again at 9.15 p.m. on video surveillance in an entertainment complex called Sky City. And then the last time she was seen was at the City Life Hotel on Queen Street at 9.41 p.m. At this time, she was with Jesse Kempson. The next day was December 2. This was Grace's 22nd birthday. Her parents had sent her a message for her birthday, but she did not reply. Three days later, she was reported missing. On December 8, at about 3 p.m., Jesse Kempson was arrested. The police thought he had murdered Grace. That same day, they had located a car that Jesse had rented on December 2 and December 3. On December 9, at 4 p.m., Grace's body was recovered. It was near Scenic Drive, about 12 miles west of Auckland. On December 10, Jesse was charged with murder. Three days later, the police would find a shovel that they believe was used by Jesse to bury Grace's body. Jesse pleaded not guilty. The trial would begin in November of 2019. It was alleged by the prosecution that Grace met Jesse through a dating app called Tinder. They were both looking for sex that was described as BDSM and rough. After they met, they went a few different places before making their way to the City Life Hotel. Jesse restrained Grace, presumably as part of the BDSM sex, then murdered her by strangulation. Based on the bruises identified in the autopsy, Jesse had choked Grace for at least four to five minutes. Three women testified that Jesse met them on Tinder and that he liked choking women as part of sex. After the murder, he took pictures of Grace's body, viewed pornography, and searched the internet for how to dispose of bodies. He bought a large suitcase, cleaning supplies, including gloves, a shovel. He rented a carpet cleaning machine and rented a 2016 Toyota Corolla. With Grace's body still in the hotel room, Jesse went on another date with a woman he met on Tinder. That woman testified about a few things that Jesse told her, which she found to be curious. He was from Australia and just visiting Auckland. He lived in the City Life Hotel. He was friends with a number of police officers. Those officers were struggling because all of the bodies that were buried in the ground around the area. Their police dogs could not detect any body in the ground if it was buried more than four feet. Again, this is what Jesse was telling this woman. 
Jesse talked about a criminal case in which a man and a woman were engaging in erotic asphyxiation, and the woman died. The man was sent to prison. He had empathy for the man. He also told the woman that he had spent the day looking for a large duffel bag with wheels. So we see more than a few indications that perhaps Jesse wasn't the ideal date to connect with on Tinder. After this, Jesse returned to the hotel room. He folded Grace's body into the suitcase that he purchased. He loaded that suitcase into the rental car, drove to an area that was remote, and buried the suitcase, still containing Grace's body, in a shallow grave. The defense agreed with many of the points made by the prosecution. For example, Jesse did dispose of Grace's body. But they said that it wasn't murder. It was a consensual sexual misadventure. Jesse was choking Grace and accidentally killed her. They were engaging in erotic asphyxiation consensually. The defense argued that Jesse had no motive. Why would he kill Grace? That didn't make sense under the circumstances. They didn't know each other. There was no long-standing dispute between them. There was no dispute between them, or at least there should not have been in that time frame. They also noted that Grace's blood alcohol concentration was over two times the legal limit for driving. They said that contributed to her death. The strategy of the defense is referred to as the rough sex defense. I'll talk more about that later. The defense interviewed people who interacted with Grace. One man who had sex with Grace said that she asked to be choked. Another man said that Grace was more naive than most women interested in BDSM. She was too trusting. A woman who knew Grace testified that Grace said she liked it when a man put his hands around her neck during sex. Here is Jesse's story about what happened. This was also, of course, part of the defense. Grace asked him to be choked. He was taken by surprise. He didn't even know what that was. Erotic asphyxiation is never something that he had ever seen or done. He did it to comply with her request. After sex, he fell asleep in the shower, then went back to bed, but found no one there. He assumed that Grace had left his room. He found her the next day on the floor. She was dead. Blood was coming from her nose. He went to call for help. He typed the numbers into his phone for emergency services, but then he froze. He realized how bad it would look when the police arrived. After he purchased a suitcase, he folded her body into it, and he cried the whole time and occasionally vomited. He was so sorry for what he continued to do over the course of a long period of time. So we can see that his story doesn't really necessarily ring sincere, but this was his narrative. Jesse Kempson was found guilty of murder. Several women had come forward after Grace's death with additional complaints about Jesse. Jesse would be found guilty for those crimes as well, including charges related to assault and threatening. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 17 years. Now moving to my analysis. Now, of course, we don't know many of the details from the actual murder of Grace. All we really have is Jesse's account, and there are reasons to believe that is inaccurate. But as I mentioned, several women accused Jesse of other crimes. One of those women was his ex-girlfriend. She said that not only was Jesse physically violent, including threatening her with a knife, but he drained her savings account, taking more than $10,000. She said the aggression started right after the relationship began. They were having an argument, and he slapped her across the face. She had already moved in with them at that point and felt trapped. She tried to work things out with him, but his anger was out of control. She said that she loved him and could not understand why he became so angry with her. She would fight back against his violence, but eventually she lost the will to resist. One night in 2017, Jesse tried to kill her. She left at that point. This was seven months into the relationship. After leaving, she obtained a protection order. Based on what Jesse's ex-girlfriend and other witnesses said, it would appear as though Jesse was intense, angry, and aggressive. Let's take a look at some of his other characteristics. Jesse appeared to have difficulty telling the truth. A few examples based on his conversations with various women. He claimed to be a cancer survivor. He said that he was going to buy a waterfront restaurant. He was a wealthy business person. Jesse appeared to be socially awkward. 
like talking on a Tinder date about how police dogs can't find buried bodies, Jesse described himself as arrogant and selfish. Some people believe that Jesse is narcissistic and psychopathic based on the characteristics he displayed. Was Jesse Kempson guilty of the crimes? I think he was. The damage to Grace's body shows that he used more force than necessary during erotic asphyxiation and maintained pressure even after she was unconscious. It could be that he simply strangled her and she never consented to anything. So again, we don't have her side of the story, so it's not clear that this action took place inside a consensual experience. We see that Jesse lied repeatedly about what happened. He disposed of her body. He had a history of violence against women. He went on a date as a murder victim's body was in his room. This is inconsistent with the story he told about feeling remorse. What do I think happened in this case? I think that Grace and Jesse both had an interest in erotic asphyxiation. I don't think Jesse had premeditated the murder, but he probably intended to take things too far. After things got started, Jesse made the decision to kill Grace, and that's what he did. This was a sexual domination homicide, similar to what we see with serial killers. Now moving to the last question, what is the rough sex defense? This criminal defense is sometimes referred to as the Fifty Shades of Grey defense, referring, of course, to the book and movie Fifty Shades of Grey, which featured BDSM. The strategy is not new. This defense has been used in many cases over the course of several years, sometimes with success, other times without success. The vast majority of the time this defense is employed, the perpetrator is male, the victim is female, and the cause of death is strangulation. This defense essentially states that the man and the woman were having sex, it was consensual, strangulation was part of it, like erotic asphyxiation, the man either lost control, didn't realize his own strength, or didn't properly manage the force being used, and death resulted. It's often used to reduce a murder charge down to something like manslaughter, or to facilitate the defendant being found not guilty. Some people criticize this defensive strategy because, as part of its execution, the victim is blamed. The perpetrator tries to say that there was consent, the woman knew the risks of the behavior. The critics would like the defense banned altogether. All deaths from strangulation would result in a murder charge. The logic behind this position is that a person cannot consent to harm that results in death. If people want to engage in rough sex, both parties have to manage how much harm is caused. If one person takes it too far, then they are guilty. They need to leave out the dying part. The proponents of the defense say a person should only be convicted of what they actually did. If two people are consenting to a dangerous activity, it makes sense that sometimes that danger will be greater than expected. For example, water skiing is dangerous, but most deaths related to it do not result in a murder charge. Skydiving, we see the same thing. What if we looked at something like boxing? If someone consents to a boxing match, is their consent not valid? If they die as a result, was a murder committed? If a person does not intend to cause death, then they do not have mens rea, a criminal state of mind. This defensive strategy creates a challenging freedom versus security debate. I can see good points on both sides. I think one of the major problems regarding sex versus other activities like skydiving or boxing is that those activities happen in the open. Sex, typically, does not. If one boxer kills another, everybody can see that it was just part of the sport. It wasn't like the boxer was trying to cause death. If something happens in the privacy of a sexual encounter, who knows what happened? If one partner is dead, then there's only one side. There's only one person telling the story. And of course, that person is always going to say that it was an accident. I don't have a solution for the legal dilemma, but as far as the safety issue, I think there are some strategies that may increase safety during these intense encounters or when considering who should be a partner for these encounters. These tips are not necessarily specific to the case of Grace Mullane. Clearly, Jesse Kempson was fully responsible for that homicide. Grace was a victim in this situation. These are simply general tips that may 
avoid some of the risks associated as people contemplate this activity. It is a dangerous activity, so it makes sense that precautions should be implemented. Moving to the behaviors that people may want to consider avoiding, a person interested in this activity may want to consider avoiding partners who have narcissistic or psychopathic characteristics, although it is sometimes very difficult to see these characteristics, especially in the short run. Narcissists and psychopaths can be very good about appearing charming when interactions are limited to just a few minutes or a few hours. It's also a good idea to avoid serial killers. This is good advice regardless of the activity being contemplated. Serial killers don't really add value to any situation. They're universally destructive. The person may want to consider avoiding partners who they do not know very well. Avoid using substances, especially to the degree that it may cause impairment. The person may want to make sure that friends or family know where they are, although obviously that activity can be considered a bit embarrassing for some people, so it's understandable why they wouldn't want to advertise what they were doing to their family members and friends. And finally, it would be a good idea to avoid lethal types of harm. I don't know how else to really put this. Strangulation is dangerous. That's why we don't see the word associated with positive prognostications or sentiment like, I'm looking forward to the strangulation later, or I like this product. Does it come with strangulation? So now moving back to the case of Grace Mullane. What lessons can be learned in a case like this? Somebody like Jesse Kempson, whose experience of excitement is enhanced by aggression and or sadism, represents a danger to society. Every excitement-seeking endeavor needs to have a limit. Some people are not good with setting limits. Those are my thoughts on the case of Grace Mullane. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.